triumphant. Uh, God accomplished every uh, goal that I had plus a lot that he had, um, as, as we'll describe here. See that uh, Liberia is right there on the Atlantic Ocean, southeastern, uh, j j just a little bit above the equator, about a, a level with uh, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, South America. I left on uh, Saturday, December 2nd, returned on Saturday, December 9th. So one week uh, out to back. And got arrived at my hotel about uh, midnight on Sunday night. Uh, my rest day was Monday. Uh, Pastor Jackson came by, quick coordination with him, and then taught the seminar for four days, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, left at midnight that night uh, for the return trip. <clears throat> Uh, quick facts about Liberia, uh, we covered these on, in my briefing a few weeks ago, but uh, it's about 80% the size of Alabama, both population and um, land area. Official language is English. They told me from the very beginning that they had no trouble whatsoever in understanding me. So that was, uh, that was a grace uh, blessing right there in that I could just move on, not have to worry about repeating myself. Uh, they asked a lot of questions. There was a lot of uh, interaction with the audience, uh, and I did have trouble understanding them and had to, had to have them repeat sometimes, but uh, we got through that. Uh, Liberia was founded in 1847, slaves returning, uh, former slaves returning from the U.S., and I found out when I was over there that they actually fought for that land and took it over from the uh, folks who, actually, who lived there uh, to begin with. But they uh, uh, designed their constitution based on ours, uh, includes freedom of religion. Uh, probably 90, high 90 percentile uh, of the population is Christian. They teach Bible in the public schools. Uh, there, there has been a level of prosperity uh, relative to other African nations over the years, uh, earlier years. Uh, and they, they were the first in World War II, the first African country to declare war on Germany. So because of that, the U.S. dumped some money into the country after the war. Uh, but then in 1980, there was an overthrow of the government by uh, a, a military leader and plunged the country into civil war. There was another coup uh, a few, some years later toward the end of the 80s and uh, both of these guys that were in charge with these two different coups were, were very, uh, very much despots. There are a lot of uh, killing of uh, political enemies, a lot of uh, war from armed groups uh, resisting them throughout the country, and it just plunged the country into uh, uh, traumatic uh, chaos uh, economically. Uh, the UN uh, let, uh, got some Afri mostly African countries, a few Europeans, uh, to come into, the, into Liberia uh, in the early 2000s and uh, try to restore order. They managed to get a free election by 2005. A lady was elected president. She has been president for 12 years now, three terms. Uh, she always wears a big hat, and if you ever see her in, a, in the pictures, uh, but she has been considered uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the spokesperson or leader uh, of all, among all the African uh, nations. So she's been very good for the country, but uh, they, they, economically they're still a disaster, extremely poor. Uh, they did have elections for president uh, in November. Uh, they got it, they narrowed it down to two candidates, neither of which got a majority, so those two candidates, while I was there, the Supreme Court validated the, uh, the election and uh, declared that it was going to be between those two, and they were supposed to have the, uh, the, the election sometime later in December. Uh, I haven't heard uh, how that's come out. Uh, Ebola virus uh, swept the population 2013 to 15. Uh, that killed a lot of people and threw the entire country into disorder as people were fearful, rioting out on the streets, protesting because the government wasn't doing more, et cetera. Uh, the U.S. dollar is their currency. They make no money. Uh, they do not produce any, any, any uh, 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 money of their own. So what I, what I brought over in dollars and spent there will remain there and be, be used by the populace. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's very easy to country to, to, uh, to get around in uh, because of that. Uh, 
I was expecting, uh, Pastor uh, Jackson had, had, had told me to expect about a, maybe 150 pastors. Uh, well, we were way, way below that, but uh, there were probably 50 to 60 pastors by my estimate, and pr plus about 25 others at peak. Uh, they are very much into uh, legalism, uh, uh, salvation, the way they were looking at salvation was that we've got to be good. We've got in order to keep our salvation, we've got to be good. We've got to obey God. Uh, tongues is rampant among almost everybody attending the conference. Uh, Pastor Jackson said that prosperity gospel is taught to a great degree, where they uh, teach that the more you give, the more God will give back to you. And uh, you know the, the idea, the concept of grace is just non-existent. One of the guys on the front row, I won't point out which one for his own privacy, uh, came up to me on the second day and gave me a, uh, a track that he had written. And, of course, he's prominent on the front page. Uh, billed himself as uh, uh, a, a Prophet Elijah uh, Jeremiah. So Prophet Elijah Jeremiah is one of these guys on the front row. Uh, and then in, in the book, the track was full of the things that he did and how he would help people by his, by his prophecy. Uh, he turned out he was an assistant pastor at a church. More about him later. Uh, of course, you know, if you know my background, I grew up uh, as the son of a uh, uh, early, one of the first uh, Assemblies of God pa uh, preachers from southwest, the backwoods of southwest uh, Alabama. Very legalistic background. Uh, Etc. So when I came out of Grace, got to Birmingham right out of college, and got under uh, under Grace Ministry, uh, that was the the um, doctrine that impacted me by far the most. Um, to me, uh, people who are in this kind of a religion of, of a I started to say Christian, but a religious Christian environment uh, have no greater need than to understand grace. So that's why my passion is to bring the message of grace to them. And uh, I, because I understand them, I know how to uh, approach them. And through, through my teaching gift, I'm, I'm able to uh, uh, feel like I'm able to communicate this. I believe this is why God has called me to this kind of a mission. <clears throat> my host was uh, Pastor Jackson Truckalon. Uh He, well, Moses... Anwubiko, who is originally from Nigeria and found a start, he stayed in the United States after college and was ordained as a, an evangelist by uh, Bob Thiem <clears throat> many years ago. Uh, he, uh, uh, Moses started a, 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 an organization called Grace Evangelistic Ministries that's based out of Nashville. And he is now into... 90 countries around the world, and they're all begging him to come. He actually visits personally about 25 or so uh, per each year, but uh, he had went into uh, Liberia in 2011, and Pastor Jackson heard him, heard the grace message, and was just floored by the idea of grace, and he has been begging uh, Moses ever since to come back. So I went at um, Evangelist Moses' request because he said that he had been putting this guy off the, the longest. Uh, what I, the way I'm looking at it is that Moses, with the, that gift of evangelism, has the grace ability to go into these countries around the world and present grace and infuse that idea, spark that idea among the people, and then people like me with the teaching ministry, it opens the door for us to go in and present systematic theology over the course of however many days and get these people to a complete understanding. Now after Moses leaves, Pastor Jackson told me later, he said, I have been wanting to start a seminary for many years, but I had nothing to teach them. Now because you have brought materials, uh, I, I've got something to teach them. Moses left him with the idea of grace, an understanding, basic understanding of grace, especially with salvation, but the pastors need more in order for them to go out and teach their own congregations and multiply that idea uh, among the populace. 
that's where I see ministries like, like mine. Um, I didn't want to stay on that one. The host church uh, was actually, yes, that says military Bible church. It was actually on a Coast Guard base. So we're right there on the beach. Uh, remember that picture of Pastor Jackson? That was the Atlantic Ocean right behind us. We, the, the picture was taken from the front porch of the church. So we're right there on the beach. Uh, the pastor of this church is, uh, was named Eric. He's actually a military chaplain. I'm not sure if it was Army or what. I think it was Army. Uh, a lot of people come into the church from off, off the base uh, to, to attend his church. Pastor Eric was a godsend. Uh, they had that military uh, uh, mindset. If I said I wanted to start at a certain time, which I later did uh, at, 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 at 9 o'clock each day, I mean at 9 o'clock he was turning it over to me. Come on. And uh, he, was, he herded those uh, cats. And, and if you've ever, you think of, uh, you think about people acting like cats and going all around, uh, you've never seen Africans. Uh, they, they were all over, uh, especially at the end when we did, we did the certificates, and they were all wanting to take pictures and just vying with each other for, uh, uh, for position to get a picture with the teacher and all like this. But uh, he had this, uh, Pastor Eric had this big, booming voice, and he was uh, an extremely valuable asset uh, that week. Contents of the seminars. Uh, on day one, I did an introduction. And I talked quite a bit, I spent quite a bit this time on uh, the issue of responsibilities of pastor, teachers, and evangelists. I told them I wasn't going to talk, talk about other spiritual gifts uh, during that week. I was there for, the subject, uh, for other subjects, but I did want to talk about those two spiritual gifts because they, most of them, claim to have one of those two. And I said, you need to understand which one it is and get your target audience. Uh, and I talked about the responsibilities. I uh, covered four basic doctrines that day which are necessary to understand in order to understand grace, why grace is necessary. And uh, the first one was who is God. We dealt with uh, the means of understanding which are uh, rationalism, empiricism, and ultimately faith. And faith being the key, the key one there. We looked at other world religions of course, that impacts them, affects them more than uh, uh, in other countries, more than it does us, because there are so many other religions around them. Uh, showed that uh, Christianity, as it should be practiced, is not a religion. It's a relationship, uh, because religions put the burden on the, on the individual to please God by, through their own efforts. Uh, we also dealt with the Trinity, the Godhead, and then the ten, uh, the essence box, the ten characteristics of God. Uh, I taught the angelic conflict. They were basically familiar with that uh, to, to some degree, but they had never considered the idea of the, the, the whole satanic rebellion, the uh, protest by Satan, the appeal by Satan, legal appeal, and that man is the, uh, uh, the test case where God is using us as evidence to show that uh, man will uh, obey me and not rebel against me, i.e. the one man, Jesus Christ, ultimately, and then the rest of us as we collectively uh, uh, abide by his plan. Uh, that whole concept had never occurred to any of them and was an amazing fact to them. Uh, we dis dealt with dispensations. I wanted them to make sure that they understood that we are not in the Jewish age. We're now in the church age. There's a dividing line, a great divide there uh, on the way that we act. And then uh, the last was the canonicity uh, to give them a, a, a better sense of, uh, of appreciation for our, where our Bible came from uh, and, and to be, be able to trust it. On uh, then days two through four, I got into the grace series. Uh, this is a series Ron asked me to, uh, two years ago after I came back from India, uh, he asked me to write it and be able to hand it to uh, people when I go uh, in, on, on mission trips in the future, and that's exactly what I did. And by the way, 
these are the lessons that I taught those four days, 147 pages. Uh, so it was it's a lot of material, a lot of in-depth. They're all single space. Uh, so it's, it, it took, uh, in, in future, in, in the past, I had tried to do three days with translation into a, a foreign language. Uh, so I, in, in actuality, I had about a day and a half of teaching. This time I had four days of teaching and I had much more flexibility to get into detail, to answer questions, to make sure that they understood the material. And I, I'm going to try to go more towards that format uh, in the future. Now in the Grace series, uh, lesson one is uh, grace as, policy, as the policy of God's interaction with man. It explains it as God's policy. Uh, definition of grace uh, got into the uh, issue of legalism versus grace that Paul dealt with in uh, Acts, Acts chapter 15, book of Galatians. And then I went into James, and we looked at James' concept of, of uh, faith without works is, is, is dead. And what does that mean? And got into the, the counter-argument there, and I, I showed them that James is correct. Uh, but it's that faith takes works. If, if it is faith, it, it starts to, to, to uh, act, and you start to use God's power and then he provides the, uh, the, the, the results, the positive results of your, of your actions. Uh, on, then the, the, the lesson two is grace salvation. Uh, I've got six pages about, um, I think it was 140 something verses or passages of scripture that show that salvation is by faith in an object, Jesus Christ, uh, as the Savior. We, we covered all that, dealt with uh, the requirement for salvation, and then the, the mechanics of salvation, and then I got into about eight problem passages that seemed to show uh, that salvation is by some other means. These went all the way from the rich young ruler uh, to the uh, passages in Hebrews and Peter that uh, talk about the dog going back to the vomit, the end is worse than the, than the beginning, and all like this, and uh, was able to show them that this is the result of discipline, uh, and these uh, horrible actions that, that come upon the, the rebellious believer are, because, are for discipline, not for punishment. Punishment is already an accomplished fact. Jesus Christ paid for the, the penalty of sin, there's three hours of darkness on the cross. He said, at the, when the lights came on, he said, it is finished, it's over with, all sin has been paid for, it's a done deal. Totally new concept to all of them. Uh, later, in the week when they were uh, given the opportunity to uh, state things that had doctrine that had impacted them the most, that was the most commonly stated uh, doctrine, that all their sins had been paid for. Uh, just, just amazing. Um, lesson three is the permanent grace status. I go over the 50 things that we receive at salvation, uh, dealt with uh, our position in Christ, that doctrine in particular, before, I had skipped the doctrine of eternal security because I, I, uh, I kind of looked at that term, eternal security, as a red flag being waved for, uh, for, for the, especially the Pentecostals and those who oppose uh, that idea. Uh, this time, I decided to go with it. And Pastor Jackson, when I told him, he cheered. He said, this is great. They need this. So I went through the, my, the whole doctrine of eternal security. I've got about 20 points uh, of reasons to believe in eternal security, reasons to support it. About number 18 or so is uh, the foot washing ceremony that Jesus uh, did uh, at the Last Supper. Uh, if you remember that, uh, Peter said, oh no, uh, the master cannot wash the feet of the servant, I must wash your feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no fellowship with me. And, and Peter says, well, in that case, wash my hands and my head too. And uh, Jesus said, no, those who have had a bath don't need a bath. They just need to wash their feet for fellowship. And, uh, but not all of you have had a bath. One of you has not had a bath. And then John adds in particular uh, a little footnote after that saying, eh, yeah, Judas and he said this because Judas uh, was about to betray him. So, of course, what that is teaching is the bath is the eternal security part. You're saved, but 
you need to continually wash your feet because uh, of, of sin that, that is still in, in our, involved in our lives. We still need to rebound. So it's a rebound principle. Well, it turns out that almost every one of them practice regularly in church foot washing. And they apply the same principle that Peter mistakenly ap applied and where the pastor plays the humble servant and washes the feet of the, of the deacons and the deacons, you know, and on down the line. And a lot of them were even doing it once a month. I said, no, wait a minute. How often are you doing the Eucharist? And I discussed the Eucharist and the purpose for it. And I said, how often are you doing the Eucharist? Well, once a month. I said, why are you putting these two on an equal plane? I said, I don't have an objection to you doing the foot washing ceremony, but if you're going to do it, don't make the same mistake and teach it the same mistake that Peter did. I said, teach eternal security. Use it to teach eternal security. Use it to teach the rebound principle. And we went through the whole rebound principle, et cetera. Uh, they even had, uh, why do you call it rebound? So I went through and demonstrated basketball and, and how you get the, you, you, you miss the shot. And if you remember uh, the definition, we had already given the definition of sin in, uh, in, in the Greek language, homotia, which means to miss the mark, literally means to miss the mark. So you miss the mark with a basket, and then you want to get the rebound and stuff it back in. And that's what you do. You, you, get, you get the rebound, you rebound and keep moving, as, as Bob Thiem used to say it. So that was, all of these were totally new concepts to these folks. Uh, the lesson uh, four was uh, by the time we, uh, we're on to about day two now, late afternoon day two, uh, lesson four is, is uh, grace through the Holy Spirit's empowerment, dealt with the uh, battle between the sin nature and the Holy Spirit, and how we trust, our, put our faith in, G, in the Holy Spirit's uh, empowerment inside of us. And uh, this is a key, key point I want to make here to, to all, all of us, it's, it's not made enough, is that faith is all that we can offer under grace. God does the work. God does the majority of it, but he does expect something from us. He doesn't expect our works. He expects our faith. And faith is something of value to him. Back in, uh, <clears throat> when I was studying uh, uh, um, business law, we studied the principle of contracts. And one of the principles that stuck in my head was that in order to have a valid contract, both parties in that contract must offer something of value. And in the case of, let's say, a grandparent wants to transfer the deed, the title of a car to a grandchild, uh, in order for the law to recognize that exchange, that grandchild must offer something of value. So it's rather common for them to pay a dollar for this let's say $5,000 car or whatever. So here you've got something of great value being given, something of much less value being given by the other party. So what do we, the lesser party, offer God that is of value? Well, he says it's our faith. So our faith is required towards Jesus Christ as an object in salvation. Our faith is required towards the Holy Spirit in order for, to allow him to operate within us and to, and, to, and to control, provide that control over the sin nature. <clears throat> he is already operating within us uh, by, through, through the, uh, the um, uh, fruit of the Spirit, but when that, when that uh, opportunity comes to make the decision between sin or doing what God wants us to do, then that's the time it's, we, our faith turns towards the Holy Spirit to choose His will. Lesson five was grace through the power of Bible doctrine. We dealt with the buildup of the soul, the makeup of the soul. I showed the, the two sides of the soul, what we inherit and the side that we learn over the course of our lives <clears throat> and how those are affected. And then the buildup of the, uh, the soul into a spiritual house uh, with the foundation being Jesus Christ, our assurance of our salvation. <clears throat> then we started applying this in lesson, in lesson six uh, through uh, talking about testing, both prosperity and um, uh, suffering testing in life. I dealt with the three categories of uh, the three reasons that uh, believers suffer, which is self-induced misery, uh, suffering for discipline, and uh, suffering for blessing. Uh, this suffering for discipline 
I emphasized that it was discipline, not punishment. Talked about a good parent. The reason they discipline their children is to change behavior. That's why God disciplines us. This was a whole new concept to them because now they began to understand, they began to get a sense of justice. Their sense of justice before had said that, well, if I sin, then God is going to punish me. And that's just. Now they look at it as saying, oh, God has disciplined me, trying to get me to change, uh, uh, change my habits, change my ways of doing things. Totally different concept. And that this principle was cited by a couple of people later in the week when they said, this is what impacted me the most. Uh, I talked at length about suffering for blessing. I used the example of Job. I also used the example of my sister who has been going through a tremendous amount of suffering over the, over the last few years. We were there Thanksgiving. Her daughter said, I don't know why God is letting this happen to her. Uh, she was implying that God was not just because my sister, her mom had been so, such a good person, so faithful to God over all these years, and even now he, he, she refuses to complain. She won't even complain about all her suffering. And why is he letting this happen to her? And uh, an, an hour or so later, uh, it got time for us to eat, and they asked me to say the blessing. And I thank God for giving suffering to my sister because of, uh, it allowed him, it allowed all of us to see her demonstrate her faithfulness to God in not complaining and to know that rewards were being built up on her account. Uh, and and uh, <clears throat> there was a... Uh, <clears throat> that was on Friday morning. There was a lady who came up to me at, 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 at lunch and told me a little bit of her story, and then she got up after lunch and told the whole class her story. She was an older lady, and just a few years ago, she had five children, one right after the other, just dropped dead for various reasons. And her husband also during this time period. And then she got sick something that was chronic and uh, continually uh, making her sick and couldn't even get out of bed several days a week. And she's been wondering, why is God doing this to me? Um, Pastor Jackson said he knew of her story, and he watched her as I was teaching this, and it said she was just wrapped in attention, just right on edge. And uh, that's why she came to me at lunch and then felt compelled to tell the whole class about it. She said, now I understand why God has allowed this suffering in my life. Uh, to see her joy, her, her suffering turned to joy. She, had not, she was too sick to come to class on Thursday the day before, and that morning, Friday morning, she was not feeling well enough to come, and she said, I've got to come. She had been on, on Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, anyway, she came that day, and she heard, heard that message that God intended for her. Uh, then lesson seven was grace and eternity, talking about the reward system. And again, this brings together our sense of justice, our sense of a need for justice. Those, who, those believers who rebel all their lives, they wind up getting into heaven with nothing. They're going to be walking around with a bare-naked uh, uh, resurrection body, uh, no decorations whatsoever, while others are going to have these heaps of decorations all over, and we're going to, we're going to wear that for the rest of eternity. So they begin to understand when, it, when Hebrews talks about the, uh, the, the sin unto death and taking the person out, well, they go, they're still going to heaven. But there's going to be tears. There are going to be tears wiped away from their eyes. They're going to have a lot of regrets because of their rebellion. So total, totally changed the concept of, of, uh, of just about all of these people. Uh, just going to show you a few photos of the class. Uh, th uh, three of these photos, or two of these photos, and then uh, bottom left here is my, uh, my driver. Um, that's my hotel. That's the U.S. Embassy. You can see the top of right over there. We're right across the street from the embassy. But my driver, uh, he's wearing a uh, U of L, U of K shirt, University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, uh, from a basketball game they played for the national championship, I think it was, a few years ago. Uh, so Jackie got a lot of appreciation out of that. Um, I thought that I'd just get a taxi, catch a, t catch a taxi back and forth morning and afternoon every day, but uh, the way they wanted, it, the way Pastor Jackson wanted to do it was to hire this car and this driver for the whole week. 
so I had total access to him. Uh, he first wanted about almost $700 for the week, and uh, I got him down to $460. Uh, but uh, anyway, it turned out this this kid who uh, was, he just worked for the for the the company. Uh, he told me uh, as we were driving to the airport our last night, he said, uh, I come, came from a Muslim family, but I had, had decided uh, years, a few years ago to uh, accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But I had no answer as to what to do after that. He said, now, after this week, I understand. So he was there as part of his job, and it was God's appointed time for him to be there. Uh, our, our graduation ceremony, we gave out certificates of attendance because they, they really like, you know, that's probably the only thing they will ever have on their wall of any, any significance. So they, they've got this certificate, and it reminds them every time they see it, they'll think about the things they learned. And by the way, I had all 147 pages printed for it and given to everybody. So they've got it to take with them because you're only going to remember about 10% of what you hear and what you take with you. Uh, is, is there for, forever. And I, I said, you've got to go back frequently and study this because there is no more important doctrines that you could ever learn than what's in these 147 pages. Uh, anyway, they gave me a shirt, as you can see. Uh, made me an uh, honorary African citizen and declared that now I am truly, fully African American. So... <laughs> If uh, I guess if that means if Jackie and I ever have any more kids, they'll be biracial. <laughs> <laughs> Some street scenes. I see a lot of uh, stalls set up downtown along the, along the uh, public streets. These little um, three-wheelers, uh, the, the, there's not many of them in these pictures that I've got here, but uh, they were everywhere. That's their taxis. I saw a lot of these in, uh, Pac or in uh, Afghanistan. Some more pictures. That is a United Methodist Church. I didn't even notice it until I look, went back and looked at the picture. There are churches everywhere. This is coming off the hill from the U.S. Embassy as we were headed to class one morning. That's the Atlantic Ocean out there. The uh, Coast Guard base itself is on a little island that's formed by two rivers that, uh, that surround it. Food was great. Uh, I know that most of the food I ate was from the hotel that catered to Western taste, but it, it, was, it was really, truly great. Uh, I did not eat the food that they were serving the people at lunch. I was too hot. It was over 90 degrees uh, every day, and I, within, uh, within five minutes, I was totally soaked, and I was just pouring down water all day long. So when lunch time came, all I wanted to do was sit, you know, collapse, and uh, I'd eat a roll. They, they brought sweet rolls in for, uh, for, for uh, a breakfast, so I'd have them save me a sweet roll, and uh, that, that was my lunch. But uh, their lunches always consisted of a lot of, uh, of rice. If I remember the first day, it was rice with turnip greens on top. Um, that was the whole meal. Uh, it got a little better after that. I was glad I didn't have to eat those turnip greens. Uh, but this is, this is our dinner at the last... Uh, the last night on the way to the airport, Pastor Jackson and my driver, uh, they probably had never, I, I don't know if they had ever eaten in a restaurant before, especially a Western-style restaurant with prices of, you know, meal for $12 or so. Um, so it was quite a treat for them. They didn't even know how to order off the menu. Well, question is, where do we go next? I don't know. I'm waiting. I've, I've already contacted uh, GEM, said, Let's, let's, let's plan another one for March, April. Uh, so I'm waiting on a call from Moses. I had a question uh, from, uh, I know I'm holding y'all over, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to be mean and do that because I got things to say. Uh, I, had a, uh, I had a question, well, I, I tried to finish the, the class on Friday afternoon. I said, that's it, through. And uh, well, can we ask questions? Hour and a half later, we finally cut the questions off. But one guy said, where is all this information? We have not heard any of this stuff that we've heard this week. Where, where is the, who is teaching? Is anybody teaching this? Is this information available? 
And I said, yes, it's out there all over the Internet, and I'll try to get you a source. And I'm still trying to coordinate with GEM about which source to give them. But those kinds of questions are, I was just constantly bombarded with all kinds of questions uh, that, that they had about uh, various practices, et cetera. <clears throat> Oh, and then one guy on that last session, I had talked so much about salvation, one guy stood up and he said, am I to understand that you are teaching that in order to be saved, all I have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior? And I said, yes. And I dealt, before whenever anybody had asked me a, me a question, I had been very patient and gone through the, the logic again to make sure they understand it. Well, this issue had been hit so much, so hard, that I purposely acted like I was impatient with him. And I said, yes, next question. And every, the whole, whole group just broke out laughing because they realized that I was not, I was out of character here. And uh, the guy, he just continued to stand up and he, he just broke into a big smile and said, thank you. And he sat down. He just wanted to hear it. He wanted to hear himself say it because they had heard it from me all week and now it was time for them to go and teach it to somebody else and he just wanted to make sure he understood it enough that he was saying it right. And, and then I looked back, when he said thank you and sat down, I looked back at him and said, you're welcome. And everybody just started breaking out and clapping because they shared that same, that same feeling. That was... Uh, it was a great week. It, it, uh, we, I was hoping to bring them from legalism further to the right toward grace, understanding, but uh, it, it exceeded my expectations. Now, I warned them that the battle is just beginning. You're going to be attacked. Satan's going to have a counterattack, and he's going to challenge grace in every aspect of your lives from here on out. Uh, and that's why it's necessary for you to go back, study these notes, let the Bible speak to you, and uh, not, not, not other people and their opinions. So they are in need of prayer. Pastor Jackson in his seminary, if he gets that going, is in need of prayer. Um, I don't an anticipate uh, uh, Al at halftime today... Uh, said, uh, you don't know what God's got for you in, my, in, in uh, Liberia. I said, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm through with Liberia. I've got 50 to 60 pastors there who now have the truth and are able to go out and distribute it. But I don't know what God's got, so we'll see. We'll see.